We'll be in chapter 4. We're going to read verses 20 through 27. If you would stand with me, we're going to give our attention to the word. that we might hold the Word of God in our hands. Let's not drift. Let's not give our minds to anything but to hear the Word of God. Verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence. I would urge us all to fix on those two words, all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's unite our hearts in prayer once again. O blessed Father, O gracious Son, O Holy Spirit, what are we but weak and feeble vessels of dust? But thou art God. In our darkness thou art light. In our death thou art life. In our weakness thou art strength. And O God, how I pray that thou wouldst come this evening and feed thy sheep. Lord Christ, thou art always among thy candlesticks. We bow before thee. We want thee to have the preeminence in everything, in everything. O oh, gracious Christ, now help this vessel of dust to preach thy word. I will give account to thee, Lord, in that great day. Help me to preach thy truth. Feed thy sheep. They're hungry. They want to hear from thee. O oh, God, may Christ be exalted. May the power of the Holy Spirit be present, and may our God be adored and worshipped. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Last time we considered why Solomon's exhortation to his son to keep or to guard his heart. John Flavel exhorts us, the heart of man is his worst part before it be regenerate and the best afterwards. It is the seat of principles and the fountain of actions, the seat of of principles and the fountain of actions. That is precisely what Solomon is telling his son. That's the message that he's giving his son in this entire passage. Flavel goes on to say the eye of God is and the eye of the Christian ought to be principally fixed upon it, upon the heart. Close quote. So then, we took up the subject of guarding our hearts and how to do it. To obey the living God in that vital personal discipline. Let me say this again. To obey the living God in that vital personal discipline, we must first internalize God's truth. Our hearts are naturally deceitful above all things. They are desperately wicked. Who can know it? Solomon therefore persuaded his son firmly but patiently to submit his heart 
to his father's teaching, which was rooted in God's word. Reinforcement, repetition, and reminder must be consistent elements of parents rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Solomon then implored his son to internalize and maintain God's wisdom. That would teach him to be just, discerning, fair, prudent, knowledgeable, and discreet in navigating life. This wise and godly father urged his son to pursue woman wisdom, to embrace her and never let her go. Likewise, he exhorted his son never to let God's wisdom slip out of his mind. Solomon also gave his son a motive for hearing his father's words and keeping them in his heart. They are life. They are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Sin produces darkness in mind, disease in the body, destruction in the soul. Nothing about it produces life. It destroys life in this world and in the world to come. Furthermore, we learned that guarding the heart requires biblical action. This is where it falls apart in America, brethren. We can talk religion, but the talk means nothing whatsoever without a life that validates what it says. Keeping the heart, then, means guarding the mind, the will, and the affections. Guarding what we are in our inmost being. Not once in a while, not occasionally, but with diligence. All diligence. Because we drift because we have the remainders of sin in our flesh, because we have a devilish enemy with a devilish army. We must guard what we are in our hearts. The reason is that out of it are the issues of life. From our hearts flow forth the lives that we lead. Your life is telling everybody around you every day what's in your heart. Regardless of what your mouth says you believe, you believe your life is saying louder what you are. The world, the flesh, and the devil wage unceasing war upon our hearts to distract us, to make us forget wisdom, to, to entice us, to seduce us, to walk after the lusts of the flesh. And that is why we need the unchanging and infallible Word of God. So we now return to our message, Guarding Your Heart. This is part two. May our gracious Heavenly Father fill our hearts with love for us in Christ Jesus. Ignite our love for Him and for His people and empower us by His Spirit to fear, to hear, to believe, and to obey His infallible Word. And when I say fear, I mean the awe and the reverence of who God is and what he says. That being the case, then, we pick up where we left off. Our 
main heading is this. Guarding your heart leads to governing your actions. Here we're in complete agreement with Flavel and his more beautiful way of saying it. But this is just the fact. If you don't guard your heart, God's truth will not govern your actions. This is verses 24 through 27. Now, it should be apparent by now, if you did not hear the message last week, I encourage you to get to part one and listen to it carefully. <clears throat> it should be apparent to us by now why the father wants his son to guard his heart, to keep his heart. If the son does not seek and soak his heart with God's wisdom so that he can guard that blessed treasure in his inmost being, his life will not stay in the path of righteousness. And the darkness that lurks in his heart and in his flesh will lead him into sins that damage, devastate, and even destroy him, as the rest of the Proverbs plainly reveals. So Solomon, the wise and godly father, now gives his son four important commands to help him to guard his heart and walk with wisdom. We will give uh, the lion's share to the first one, and the rest we will mention briefly. Number one, master your mouth. Master your mouth. Verse 24, the Spirit of God says, put away from thee. Now, who's he making that command to? Well, Solomon is making that command to his son. God the Father is making that command to us. Master your mouth. Put away from thee. That means we have a responsibility to obey God. Now, here's what we normally do. Oh, God, take it away. Oh, God, just take stuff away. Okay, now that's not a terrible prayer, but he's telling you to do it. Did we get that? We have responsibilities as God's children. He's loved us before the foundation of the world. His son agreed to come to be our sin-bearing substitute. He sent his son into this cesspool of a world, into this dung heap, to save his people from their sins. He was indeed the God-man, truly God, truly man in one holy person. He kept the law in our place. He died upon Calvary's cross in our place. He rose again into glory. He is seated at the Father's right hand, and he is one day coming back for us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He poured that glorious gift out to his church, and he says, now walk with me. He's not walking for us. He lives within us by the power of His Spirit. He's given us His Word to tell us His will. He doesn't do that so that we can sit there and just say to Him, yeah, this is all nice. It'd be nice if somebody did this. You have a responsibility. And stop letting grace be an excuse for continuing in your wickedness. Master your mouth. Learn how to do that. It's supernatural. You can't do it without the Word. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't do it without grace. But it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. He doesn't need to do it because he's equipped you to do it and he's calling you to trust him believe his grace and let that be the fire and the fuel in your service to him he says stop then stop i've had people come to me and say yeah 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 but god's got to do it 
I said, give me the verse for that. And they never do because there isn't one. People that are born again have the spirit that created the world dwelling in them. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you and is at your disposal to engage the powers of darkness? Why are we told put on the whole armor of God? Well, no, Lord, you do that. God says, I don't need to do that. You need to do that. And I've given you everything that you need to do that. Trust me and do it. We're so full of American religion. We'll let somebody tell us, you know what? It's all about grace. It is all about grace. But then they divert. I've had people stand right here and say, God's got to do it. I said, he's already done it. Are you born again? You have the very spirit of God within you. Yes or no? You've got to answer that question. Does this is one of the reasons Paul says to the Corinthians, whom he ministered to, uh, do you have the spirit unless you be reprobates? Do you have that spirit? Yeah, yeah, but my flesh. Is your flesh stronger than God? Stop making excuses. Stop using grace as an excuse to go on in your weakness. Are we weak? Of course we are. You're looking at a vessel of dust that would fall apart before I finish the sermon. But I believe the God who fills his people with the power of the Holy Ghost. He changes people. They are new creations, or that's a lie. Brethren, how much are we living like atheists while we call ourselves Christians? How many excuses will you continue to make? Believe your God. Believe your God. Believe your God. He loves you. He has brought you into union with the power that created the universe. Is that true or is it not? Does it say he works in you both to will, to desire to do it, to want to obey Christ? And does he work within you to do it? It doesn't say he works within you to will, but just so that you can sit and not do what he says. The enemy loves to pull the, the, the thing, the, the, the wool over our eyes and say, you can't do anything. You can't do anything. And so we say to God, Lord, I can't do anything. That's not where we should stop. I can't do anything of myself, but I can believe you. You've told me to master my mouth. I've got a lot of work to do. All that name the name of Christ, young and old, must by faith in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit learn to master your mouth. That's what the Father's saying here. Put away from thee a froward mouth. That means a perverse mouth. And what does it mean when we say froward in, in our language, in modern English? What are we talking about? We're talking about something that isn't being used in light of its original creation. Right? If, if you're working on a house and you need to drive a three-inch nail... You can do it with a screwdriver, maybe, but it's not like using a hammer. To use a screwdriver would be perverse. It would be froward because that's not what it was created to do. You can drive a three-inch screw with it, but driving a three-inch nail is almost impossible. 
Somebody might be able to do it depending on the kind of wood it was and providing that the handle of the screwdriver wouldn't shatter after a few blows. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your mouth was made to do something, and most of us don't ever come close to using it for what it was made for. And that's praising God and edifying his people. Praising God and edifying his people. Put away a froward mouth. Your mouth was made to praise God. Your mouth was made to worship. Your mouth was made to sing praises to the one who loved you before the foundation of the world. Of course, when we talk about mastering our mouths, that leads us directly back to the heart. And that's the issue. <clears throat> our Lord Jesus taught out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. There it is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And again, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. There's two witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the thing is true. Your mouth tells on your heart. Do you gripe? You're a griper. You're rebelling against God. Right? Our, our hearts get connected to our mouths and they just have a way of, of pointing a finger right back at us of what we are. Very often we don't even realize it. We just got the thing going. But everybody that's got any sensibility can tell, mm -hmm. wow, there's a heart on display here. Cursing, swearing, coarse words, and blaspheming reveal a godless heart. Lying, white lies, no such thing, blatant lies, half-truths for the purpose of sinfully deceiving reveal a devilish heart because the devil was a liar from the beginning. Filthy jokes, lewd remarks, pornographic talks, sexual innuendo reveal an immoral heart. Boastful words, self-centered speech, arrogant remarks reveal a prideful heart. Sassy back talk, rude replies, smart aleck answers, disrespectful responses reveal a rebellious heart. We could go on. Rage. Anger, blistering, acid words, an angry heart. The Holy Spirit says through Paul, let a little bit of corruption, a little corrupt communication come out of you. <laughs> let no, no, zero. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I mean, we all stand condemned, right? Now, what do we do? Lord, take it away. The Lord says, no, you master it. I'm with you. I've given you the power. I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to mortify that sin. I want you to wage war on it. I want you to determine when you get up, you're going to take the sword of the Spirit, and one of you is not going to be standing in a few minutes. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Now, you probably don't have to struggle with this. I know that I do. It says, which is good to the use of edifying. <clears throat> um, with the way I grew up, with the weakness and character of my mind, I can say something foolish in a nanosecond. But it takes a little work to say something edifying. It takes me a little work to think about how to use my mouth. 
Do you come here on the Lord's Day to edify? Is it your project? And I see Brother Randy, I want to say something to him that will encourage his heart in Christ today. Or do we just, are we just going to sit and talk about bass fishing? Yeah. Are we going to edify one another? I'm not saying we always have to speak scripture. That wouldn't hurt, but far too often it's phony. And I, I'm saying from the heart, do you come to edify anybody? Young person, older person, do you want to come and speak gracious words that bless them and encourage them and build them up in the faith? That's what you've got a tongue for. God gave it to you. And he gave you the power to use it that way. You can do it. We have to think about it. Paul says, that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace. Grace unto the hearers. Now, that can even be a rebuke. I've had brothers here. I've even had some sisters. Reprove me, rebuke me. And that ministered grace to me. I knew right away I, how much I needed the Lord and how much I needed to guard my mouth. Master your mouth. It doesn't say think about it once in a while when you know you've really blown it. But be planning and praying and thinking and asking the Lord to grant you the grace to speak unto edification. Do you think he's going to say, oh, no, I don't have any grace for that. You're on your own. You're on your own, man. He doesn't do that. He's given us what we need. We need to use it. You're making me depend on me. No. I'm telling you to depend on God and then do it. There's a difference. Young people and adults, especially parents, please hear this. Scripture reveals that tongue, tongues, lips, and mouths are instruments that can be used for good or evil. <clears throat> Solomon warns, whoso keepeth guards his mouth. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. This is a day, brethren, in which talk just doesn't work. We need to believe God and obey him because he loves us and because he's equipped us to obey him. You don't know how strong my, my passions are. Then you don't know how strong God is. And you need to learn. He wants his people to reflect him. We don't reflect him by wallowing in our sins and saying, oh, I can't help it. <clears throat> Let us hear the warning of James. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. It defiles the whole body. He doesn't stop there. And setteth on fire the course of nature. It's like we're human flamethrowers. <sighs> Dragons. Going here and going there and setting one fire after another. Burning down this city. Burning down that castle. I saw one of the most horrifying videos I've seen in a long time. Just recently of someone that was trying to escape in the, the horrifying, horrifying fires out in California. And, and it was with a dash cam. 
And it, I've never seen anything that made me think so instantaneously of hell. There was nothing but fire everywhere you looked. And, and the person that was driving was doing everything she could to get out of the flames. I mean, things were falling right and left. Limbs were falling. I mean, it looked like that there were flamethrowers shooting across the, the, the sky. All you could see was fire. and You could hear it. You could hear it burning, roaring everywhere. Your tongue can start something like that. That's one of the ways churches are ripped to pieces. That's one of the ways marriages are utterly destroyed. She kept saying as she was driving, she was doing everything she could, man. I mean, fire falling everywhere. She'd get into tunnel for a few minutes, and then she'd be back in the fire. And all she could say was, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Because she could feel the heat. Sometimes when a car is in a situation like that, it melts the tires. And that's the end. I thought of people in hell. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. And there will never be an answer. And the fire will rage. Oh, our tongue can set on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Not the Holy Spirit. The tongue can no man tame, says James. How strong is that? And what he's talking about, of course, is no man in and of himself. And that's why I'm making the distinction. We trust God and all that he's given us, and then we do. We don't look to our own strength. We don't look to ourselves. We're not our own saviors. We look to our Savior. But in our Savior, we're in union with him by whom we can overcome. To him that overcometh, he repeats regularly in the first few chapters of Revelation. How do we overcome? Faith in Christ and believing. We're in union with Christ, that we have the spirit of Christ. We have the word of Christ. We have the people of Christ to encourage us, to love us, to spur us along the way, to rebuke us. And it's with the tongue. Oh, brethren, do you come looking? Do you come looking to bless? To use your tongue for grace? Or are you just coming to hang out with your friends? Guaranteed, you won't, your tongues won't go in the direction they ought to. If it's just to hang out with your buds. Young people, adults, after telling his son, guard your heart, he says, now master your tongue. Because your heart is telling on you. Your heart is saying whether you're guarding your heart. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Well, I didn't say any of that. If, I, if I'd have said that, they'd say, oh, that negative preacher. How unloving. Why don't you encourage me today? Well, why don't you tell James that? <laughs> why don't you tell James, hey, man, I need some encouragement. He says, I'm encouraging you. Because of who you are and what God has done for you, the extraordinary things that he's done to save you from your sins, the fact that you're in union with his son, get a hold of that tongue. My friends, you can do unthinkable, irre irreparable damage with your tongue. Or you can use it to do good, to impart grace, and to bestow blessings. 
Isn't that amazing? You can bestow blessings on people. Oh, brother, oh, sister, thank you for sharing your heart with me. Let me pray for you. Oh, God, here is my brother. Here's my beloved one. I pray for him today. I pray for her. Oh, Christ in heaven, my sister, my brother is grieving, is hurting, is struggling, is failing against some sins. Grant grace. Build them up in the faith. Oh, Christ, the prophet, speak to them. Oh, Christ, the priest, intercede for them. Oh, Christ, the king, guide and lead them. Build them up today. Grant them triumph over these things. How hard is that? Don't just say, sure, I'll pray for you. Pray for them. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I don't know how many times over the years I've said, okay, you know, I'll pray about that. And I, sure, I mean it when I say it. I'm not saying it uh, lightly. I'm not saying it to uh, tell a lie. But I go in and the 3,000 things that are always running around in my mind get going and it, I lose it. I forget it. If I don't write it down and get it in my prayer list and then they come back later on and said, oh, thank you for praying for me. <laughs> Maybe that doesn't happen to you. <sighs> well, let me, let me tell you, it's true. You can destroy or you can create life with your tongue. Build them up, strengthen them, love them. <clears throat> we as parents sometimes fail. And that's when we need to repent in the presence of the children we have failed before. A father that sins before his children and doesn't repent is not only destroying them, but is a hypocrite if he demands the same from them. <clears throat> Let me tell you, the way you use your tongue will pass down through the generations. Listen to me again. The way you use your tongue will pass down through the generations. I can tell you, young people, there'll be things that you see, things that you hear in your home. Uh, no doubt, if you have parents that are sinners, there'll be moments when they will say things that are sad and sinful. And if they repent, everything's glorious. You can keep the house happy. If not, you may look at some of that and say, you know, I'm never going to do anything like that in my home. I can tell you that what's been programmed in your brain is going to come out. Given the right circumstance, it's going to come right out of that heart. You better now be learning how to use your tongue to build, to encourage, to rebuke, but to rebuke in love. <clears throat> It will pass down through the generations. You need Christ dwelling in your heart by faith. You need the Spirit giving you self-control, and He does. You need the Word governing and informing your speech, and it does. It's all there. The Lord has given you everything. Everything. We need to use it and learn how to use it. Let us remember that the psalmist said of Christ... Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. I need more grace in my lips. How about you? Well, we can go to the God who has the unlimited amount and say, Lord, right here, pour your grace into my lips. Help me to use what you've given me. Help me by thy spirit to take hold of this tongue. Help me by thy spirit to master this mouth. May it be a fountain of blessing. Well, and we see this worked out in Jesus' life. All bear him witness. All bear him witness and wondered. They were amazed at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. 
Now, it's true. Let's remember. People were amazed at the gracious words. Regardless of what tone of voice he had when he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. It stung. It was intended to. There are times when we have to say, let the righteous smite me. It will be a kindness. But Christ spoke graciously. He never just got bent out of shape and then let everybody around them have it. All bear him witness of his gracious words. We're in union with him. Doesn't that encourage you? You're in union with him. So by prayer and communion with him, by trusting the word of God, by trusting the spirit of God, by trusting the the son of God, we can speak grace. We can. Paul commanded the Colossians, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And why Solomon declared, the lips of the righteous feed many. That's the kind of lips we want, isn't it? By God's grace, let us be righteous. And then let us speak of Christ and his righteousness. Let us speak of righteous things. Let us speak good things. You say, man, well, you know, we all fail. Next. why do we make these excuses? Of course we all fail. But does God tell us what to do when we fail? He surely does. And that's where we're not so good. We think it's just in the thing that we do. No, it's how we follow what we do. It's not that you lose your temper with your spouse or your children. It's what you do with your mouth after you have sinned with your mouth. Does that make a picture? Do we get that? The lips of the righteous feed many. And we say, that's a goal. Let's shoot for that. (laughs) Again, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Oh, fill our hearts. Fill our hearts with thy spirit, oh God. Fill us with what is good and gracious. And you know, it... It doesn't just pour out. You've got to guard your heart. You have got to take God's word and internalize it. You've got to take truth to displace lies. And then you can begin to speak in ways that bring glory to God. You say, it seems hopeless. Mm Mm-hmm. So? Well, I've had to struggle with this all my life. You'll probably struggle with it to your last breath. But are you struggling? Are you looking at Christ and saying, I want to speak graciously. Lord, help me today to do that. Help me to edify. Help me to edify my spouse today instead of like my normal grunts. Right? Help me to edify. Help me to build. You're a builder if you can realize it. I'm I'm a sinner. We know that. That's why we have a Savior. And the Savior does great things with his people. Do you believe him? This is what I'm trying to get you to see. What goes in here sooner or later is going to come out. We need to fill it with truth. Fill it with the love of Christ. Oh, may God fill us so that there might be an edifying flow from our lips. I can be foolish in a second. I want to be gracious thoughtfully. That takes prayer, repentance, mortification, and basking in God's love for us. Lord, you love me. And at the end of this whole project, I'm going to be like your son, Christ. Keep doing your work. And then help me to obey when you call me to the work. Well, 
Number two, after master your mouth, govern your gaze. Then verse 25, let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. The picture here is getting on the right road and staying right on it, just walking straight on that road, not getting off to the right hand, not getting off to the left. Keep your eyes fixed on the right thing. We're all on a journey. We're all on the way to the celestial city. We are on a glorious Christ-walked journey. We're following behind. I mean, as I I heard one man say, I, I don't like these kind of sayings sometimes, but he said, like, we're following where the rut of his cross dragged the ground. Yes. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to say what I know you're probably anticipating. You find it in the Word of God. The path is laid out in the Word of God, and it's on the road with Christ. Keep your eyes right there. It's a narrow path, one person at a time. One person following Christ. Follow Him. Keep your eyes fixed on where you're going. Young people, we must all by faith in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit learn to govern our eye gates. First of all, for faith, by faith, looking to Christ, soaking our hearts with his word and walking in the direction where he is. He's seated in glory. We're on the way there. The extraordinary thing is somehow he is seated in glory and he's with us. Govern your eye gates. Jesus said the light of the body is the eye. The images, the things that are in this world that you permit into your eye gates can take you right off the road. Bunyan had it perfect, perfectly. We can, we can get off into bypath meadows. The images that you permit into your heart through your eyes can last a lifetime. To protect your heart, you must guard your eyes and keep them fixed where they need to be fixed. What is holy, what is righteous, what is good, what is pure. You're not gonna, you're not gonna miss the ugly things of the world, but you don't need to go looking for them. Pornographic images, erotic pictures, immodest clothing can kindle the fires of lust. Trinkets, wealth, jewels can, can also start the fires of lust, just a different lust. Stuff, I've got to have stuff. I live for my stuff. Our Lord taught, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her all ready in his heart. I preached that. I used to have a prison ministry, and for many years I would go in every Thursday night and preach to the men in that jail in Clinton, Louisiana. And one night I had that text, and I said, Whosoever looketh on a woman to trust after her hath committed, hath, not will, hath committed, past tense, with her already in his heart. It was really quiet for a moment, and one of the guys said, If that's true, everybody in this room's in trouble. That's exactly right. I said, you are 100% right. Your preaching was better than mine. Everybody in here is in trouble. You're in trouble with God for the images that you permit into your mind. When they are images that are inappropriate. And they can be inappropriate in many ways. Magazines and catalogs filled with luxurious homes. There are some people that all they can do is just look at homes and stuff and say, this is what I want. 
And this is, oh, I've got this, but now I want to change it to that. Oh, I've got to have this, I've got to have that. And, and what are they being dragged by the nose through? The things of this world have become their gods. What you think about, what you live for is your religion. I mean, every now and then I see a house and I go, wow, that's extraordinary. And then I remember, ah, I've got a mansion waiting for me. Jesus himself said, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> it's not going to be like Motel 6 in heaven. It's going to be something glorious, something expansive, something that's holy, something that in some way will just be deeply satisfying that somehow we're in glory with Christ. I mean, we don't have to have a, a mansion, right? We could all just sleep out in the, in the glories of whatever heavenly, the heavenly world is. Who needs a house? We're going to be there with Jesus. But Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go... I will come again, and I'm going to bring you to myself. There's, there's some glory waiting for us that our minds can't anticipate. And what the lost man is constantly doing every day is trying to build it here now. Do we understand that? They want their heaven now. They're building their heaven now. And it will all fall apart. Electronic gadgets. Oh. I like gadgets. I mean, I do. I have from the time I was a child. Makes noises, makes pictures, does something. Oh, I like it. <clears throat> and I'm not the only one, as several large companies have proven to the world. People everywhere love gadgets and love stuff. Okay, we can have a, a tool that's useful. And we should use useful tools. But at the same time, they can also become our bail. Sometimes we live for these. There's nothing wrong with them, as long as they're not ruling us. Costly clothing, fine clothing, oh yes, we're so tasteful. Malls filled with expensive jewelry. Oh, man, I've got to have, you know, some kind of uh, fine rock hanging around my neck or, <laughs> or something. I mean, there, there are people, that's, that's what their conversation's about, and that's what their money goes to, and that's what they're all about. The latest fashions can all stoke the fires of covetousness, discontent, envy, and pride. The images you dote on and let into your heart, the thoughts that you believe are worth thinking, the things that you fill your soul with, what are they? Are they helping you to walk on the path? Or are they helping you off the path? Ah. Guard your gaze. <laughs> Govern your gaze. What are you looking at physically? What are you looking at mentally? What are you looking at emotionally? What, what gets you through the day? Should be Christ. It should be knowing that he's walking with me in some way that's astounding. And yet at the same time, he's waiting at the end. And we will see him in his astonishing beauty. That's what I want to see. When our eyes have been glorified, we'll see what they were made for. We'll see Christ. We'll see him in his glory. When our ears are glorified, 
we will hear him and we'll hear him as we've never heard him before. And it will be glorious. Well, guard your heart, master your mouth, govern your gaze. Let's keep our eyes on Christ. Thirdly, ponder your path. Ponder your path. It says, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Notice how that's said. Let all thy ways be established. What are we talking about? I mean, we're generally thinking, here's what I want to do. Here's where I'm going. Here, this is what I'm all about. But the Christian is saying, oh, which way do you want me to go? And how do you want me to do it? Which way do you want me to go? Put my feet in the path, O Lord, and help me to walk in it. Let your steps be established. Because we don't walk in righteousness naturally. Thankfully, that's why the Lord does give us a new heart. And there is that within us burning to walk in the path. Isn't that wonderful? He's given you everything that you need to walk with him and to obey him. You have it. It's like someone telling you, I've put $15 billion in your bank account. And we say, hmm, well, I'm not so sure about that. And we don't write any checks on it. We don't spend it. We just say, hmm, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've been poor. I guess I'm just going to be poor. I mean, poor is uh, the way it goes for me. Fifteen billion dollars, yeah. Hmm. If we really believed that we had it, we would likely begin to use it wisely and spend it. Yes? You have the inexhaustible Spirit of God. You say, I get weary in the path. He doesn't. I don't understand what's going on. He does. What do you need that you don't have? Well, we all could say the finished product, right? <laughs> we want the finished product. Finish your work. Help me to get this tongue to where it's, man, it's speaking grace and glory. That's the path we're on. We should be pondering it. Not only is Christ at the end, we will be glorified. We will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Ponder where you're going. Think about it. Read in the word of God and say, where am I? Lord, I want to walk where you want me to walk. Establish my feet. Give me grace. Give me wisdom, and, and I will walk in it. Will you do it? No. You do it. Trust me and do it. And then you'll fall on your face and you'll go, I knew this was going to happen. Right? Then that happens sometimes. Well, what happened with Peter in the boat? Is that you, Lord? Yeah. Well, tell me to come out there and I'll come out there. That's the right spirit. He got out and he made a few steps and he went under. But what happened? The Lord did not stand there and say, Ah, oh, <laughs> I knew you weren't going to make it. Peter, you're such a blowhard. I knew you weren't going to make it. It says instantly Christ caught him. And the only thing he said to him is, Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Christ is going to be there instantly to pick you up, call you out sometimes on your doubting, and put you right back on the road. He's not going to leave us. He shed his blood so that we could be his forever. He's not going to let us go. Someone asked me today, please pray for me. Pray that the Lord won't let me go. And I wrote back and said, he's not going to. He's not going to. He's never going to. Let your feet be established and walk in the path. 
And when you fall, look at the cross and get up and go again. We'll have some bruises on our knees, some skins on the nose. But when we get there, it will all be perfected and made like our Savior. This is not a fairy tale. Guard your heart. Think right. Get on the path and let your feet be established. Your Lord is with you every step of the way. Well, finally, continue your course. Verse 27, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. It's very similar to the previous one. This is the final admonition of the section. And it is very simple. Let your feet be established and stay on that path. Stay there. How do we do that? We believe our Christ. We trust him. He tells us, read Romans 6 until that passage sinks down into your heart. Sin shall not reign over you. Well, very often with our misunderstanding of grace and misapplication of it, we'll say, well, yeah, except for now. It's like, no, no, sin shall not have dominion over you. You know why? Because we have a new Lord, and the new Lord is not going to let us go. He bought us. We are His. You are not your own. You're His blood-bought property. Get yourself in His path by faith in Him. It's all by faith in Him. But that faith works its way out into the life of obedience. Obedience is not an ugly word. It's beautiful. You were made for obedience. You are born again for holiness. You are born again for what is right and good. The new, for new covenant believers, this means enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. It's a narrow path. It's not a path of popularity, but it's the path of life. The world may never even knew you existed, but God's eye has always been on you, always. Before he said, let there be light, his love in Christ was eternally fixed on you. Now he's not going to let you go. Well, well we need to finish up here. Let me say quickly, <clears throat> let's apply this wisdom just a little bit. And once again, we agree with John Flavel's summary. By keeping the heart, understand the diligent and constant use and improvement of all holy means and duties to preserve the soul from sin and maintain its sweet and free communion with God. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. In other words, use what God has given you. That's the point. And look what he's given you. I mean, he, he didn't reach down into his pocket, bring out a penny, and flip it in, into your cup. He reached down into his everlasting pocket, and he opened up the greatest treasure chest ever imaginable and took the most precious treasure, his son, and gave him to us. And he says, now, diligently stay in communion with that Christ. Your flesh won't make it. You'll have to trust Christ. But with the spirit and the word and the wonderful means of grace that he's given you, engage your God, use what he's given you, and show forth his glory in this darkened world. Parents, 
let me say to you, firmly and patiently persuade your children of God's truth. Your children are the image bearers of Almighty God. While you cannot save them, you can prepare them to be vessels of the Holy Ghost. When God saves them, they need to regularly hear the doctrines of God's triune nature. Within the nature of the one God, there are three eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, yet one God. They need to hear and to see you believing and resting in God's sovereignty. It's not just a, a, a word that we use. It's not just a team that we join. It's believing who God is according to the testimony of the infallible scriptures and then living that way, believing that he truly governs all things. They need to hear and to see you believing that. They need to hear and see you believing in God's eternal purpose, his glorious covenant of redemption, his holiness, his grace, his mercy, his love. They need to hear about this. But not only should they hear about it, they should see it being practically worked out in your life. When there's tragedy, what do you do? How did God do this to me? Well, that's a denial of the doctrine. He can do whatever he wants to you at any time. But it will always come wisely and with his eternal purpose in mind. I mean, the book of Job is not there just for us to sit and puzzle over. Is that not, isn't, that, isn't that true? God says, you see my man Job? Yeah, you take his stuff, he's going to curse you. Take his stuff. He doesn't go and prepare Job. He doesn't send an angel to say, Job, you don't know what's about to happen tomorrow. You better be prayed up for tomorrow. It's just all of a sudden, Job's world collapses. It isn't because Satan overcame God and won a battle. God said, go and do what you want, but don't take his life. You either worship that God or you don't. Don't play with God. Don't try to change him to fit your team. He's almighty. He can say, all right, you go touch his body. It doesn't mean that we, you know, we haphazardly uh, bounce off the providence of God, but it's when it comes, when, when heartache comes or when joys and blessings come, what do you do? How do you respond to that God? It all came from him. All of it. All of it. It's the most beautiful pillow you can lay your head on. Or you'll get angry with God. God did this. God did that. How could he do? How could he be good and do that? Well, the very fact that you're still breathing and eating and not in hell shows you how good he is. Now, ask why you're here. <laughs> Lord, Tell me about your son. Help me to walk with him. Well, we could go on, but we're not going to have part three. So I would say this for young people and children, memorize and meditate on God's word with a view to applying it. You hear that? Not just, oh, read God's book and know what it says. That's important. But live what it says. Do what it says. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Draw it down into your heart with prayer. Plead with God to brand his glorious word in your heart. And then walk in it. You'll fall down. You won't walk perfectly. It'll even look funny sometimes. But it'll be real. That's what you want. You want to really walk with Jesus. If our Heavenly Father teaches us from the Scriptures, hide my commandments with thee, let's get to it. Hide his commandments here. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Let's memorize them. Memorize these truths. They're life-giving. Like Peter said, Lord, where would we go? Thou hast the words of life. The words of life. The words of life. Yeah, well, I guess we got to read my Bible. You know, we're supposed to. Man, 
repent and say, oh God, blood was shed that I might have the word of God in my hands. I have the word of God. Help me to know it. Help me to learn it. Help me to find you in its pages. Let me see your promises. Let me see your rebukes. Let me walk with you with all my heart. Well, Guarding your heart and staying the course requires the guidance of God's word, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God in Christ, and the promise of the forgiveness of sins displayed in the gospel. Do you believe that God has done this? That he's given you these things? That he's gifted you with his son? If he's given you his son, what good thing do you think he's going to hold back? If Eve had guarded her heart, she would not have listened to the serpent's lie. If Adam had guarded his heart, he would not have eaten the forbidden fruit from his own wife's hand. If David had guarded his heart, he would never have committed adultery with Bathsheba. If Solomon had taken his own counsel and guarded his heart, he would not have married so many foreign wives and fallen into idolatry in his old age. The man who gave this very counsel broke it. Let's be wise. Let those things awaken us to see that the greatest of God's people can fall into life-changing sin. But let us repent of our sins, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and by His grace, recognize the importance of guarding our hearts. And let's encourage every, each one of ourselves with that. Amen. Well, Father, we weak and feeble creatures, we know that. Your Word makes it clear in our lives, spout it out daily. But thou hast saved us, and thou hast done great things to us and great things for us. May our hearts soar above the dung heap of this world. We think of the greatness and the goodness that thou hast shown us in Christ thy Son. O oh God, help us in our feebleness to show forth thy mighty strength to this world as thy people have done through the ages. O oh my Father, Forgive our sins and help us by faith in Christ to walk faithfully with thee, guarding our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.